All right, so we're continuing our series in the book of Galatians. Uh, we're in, talking about the doctrinal case for justification by faith. This is part three of that message already, this section of Scripture that we are going through. And today we are going to be talking about the purpose of the law. And we're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 15 through 29. Again, we're looking at the purpose of the law. It is so important uh, that you and I know the purpose of the law. There's many Christians today who don't really know it, and today they think that they still have to live according to the law, that this is the way that they are made righteous. And it's not so. We are made righteous. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And today, the way that we even are sanctified and the way that we are made righteous as we continue in this process of sanctification is by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us and works through us. So the law isn't going to accomplish that task. It's the Spirit of God in us as we yield to the Spirit of God that is going to accomplish that work in us as believers. And the way we live today is that we live by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so we need to know this because there's so many Christians today, they are in bondage, they are failing, they are struggling today because they're putting themselves under a, uh, a system of works, they're putting themselves under law again where they're trying to become righteous again by their own works and their own ability. No, we do it by faith and through the power of the Holy Spirit working through us, okay, and in us, okay? So Jesus came and he set us free, and the way we live is by faith. Amen. So let's look at this first point in verses 15 through 18. The question is, does the law cancel the promise? Does the law cancel the promise? In verses 15 to 18, Paul says, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And he does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is, Christ. Now what I'm saying is this. The law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Okay, so does the law cancel the promise is what he is speaking about here. Now Paul uses a human illustration here. As he says, I speak in terms of human relations. We, as people, know how to make covenants. We know how to make promises to one another. I mean, our, our world is full of this. We make wills, and we're bound according to those wills. Once the will is made, we can't add to it, change it. Uh, if you look at uh, even a mortgage, you go and get a mortgage at the bank, what happens is you're coming into a covenant, you're coming into agreement. And when you sign that agreement, you're bound to that agreement, and you can't make changes while you're in there. Okay, So we as humans, we know how to hold to covenants. We know how to make these things, and we know how to hold them. Now, of course, we do know how to break them as well. Okay, But we know how to make these covenants. And so if we as humans don't set aside a covenant or make additions to it, how much more will God uphold his promise given to Abraham? So we as people know how to hold a covenant Okay, and hold to those promises. How much more will God hold to his promise is what is being said. Because again, God is faithful to his promises. We know this from the word of God. We know this from our walk with God, living for him. As we go through this life walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, what do we find? We find that he is faithful to his promises. We find that he never goes back on his word. We know that his word never returns to him void. Amen. But it accomplishes what he sets it forth to do. So God is faithful. God is true. God is not a man that he should lie. So when he speaks something, he holds to it and he won't break it. And so God made a promise to Abraham and he will not break that promise. He will not change that promise. Okay? He will not add to it in any way. 
And that's what we need to know here. So he upholds his promise that he gave to Abraham. And the promise that God made to Abraham was only dependent upon God. And Abraham believed the promise, and likewise, we must have faith in the promise of God. Okay, so when we talk about the promise, we're talking about how we would be justified by faith through the coming seed, Jesus Christ. He was the coming Redeemer who would save us from our sins. Now, that is only based, it's a promise, only on God's part, as we're going to see. And God will not break his part. It's not dependent upon man in any way. So the promise will not fail, is what we are being told. And so we come into this by faith and believing the promise of God. Now, the promises, they were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, as verse 16 said. The promises were spoken to Abraham, to his seed, and it does not say, and to seeds. Okay? So notice, to his seed. It's in the singular. So it's being spoken of a certain person. Paul said that the, it's spoken to the seed, so it's not referring to many descendants of Abraham, but it's referring to a particular descendant who is the Lord Jesus Christ. The promise to Abraham and his seed is fulfilled in Christ. The law did not cancel or change the promise that God made. Now here's the thing. I'm going to quote to you from a commentary right away. But some people were thinking that the, the promise that God made to Abraham must have been made to Abraham and his immediate descendants. And then it must have been fulfilled because then God brought in the law. He brought in another covenant. And so the previous one must have been fulfilled. The promise must have been fulfilled already because there's a new way that comes in the law. That's what some were saying. But it's not true because the promise is fulfilled in Christ. Okay? The law, when God puts the law in place, he doesn't add to the promise that he gave to Abraham. He doesn't change that. He's not adding to it. The law is being put in place for a very specific purpose, as we are going to see. Okay? So, the promise is not fulfilled before the law or in the law. The law doesn't add to the promise or change the promise. The promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the law has a very specific purpose, okay? You have to keep that in mind. Now, the Expositor's Bible Commentary says this, If those promises were made only to Abraham and his immediate descendants, they might well be considered fulfilled even before the giving of the law. The law then would inaugurate a new era in God's dealing with humankind. But the promises were not fulfilled in the period before the giving of the law. Okay, did you get that? The promise is not fulfilled in the time before the law. Paul argues that they were embodied in the coming Redeemer, through whom the fullness of the blessing was to come. That Redeemer was Christ. Consequently, God's blessing of justification by grace through faith, it spans the ages and the law, whatever else one might think of it, served only an in-turn function. Paul's essential point is that the promises made to Abraham, they must be in effect eternally. And they are. So when God made the promise to Abraham, it was a promise that was in effect for all time. Because when you think about the promise, the promise that was given to Abraham spans be even before the creation of the world. Remember that what Re Revelation says about Jesus Christ, it says that he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So what does that tell us? It tells us that God had a plan in place before the foundation of the world to send the Redeemer, okay, who would send Jesus Christ, who would save his people from their sins. That is even before the creation of the world because he knew that man would fall into sin. And so the promise that comes to Abraham is an eternal one that is going to be fulfilled in Christ for all time. And all who come to faith in him will be justified by faith in him. Okay? So the promise finds its fulfillment in Christ, the promised seed. The way a person receives the blessings and the promises of God is by faith. Faith. 
By faith, they were justified before the law. By faith, they were justified during the law. And by faith, we are justified after the law. So it's all by faith. Before the law, it's faith. During the law, it's faith. After the law, it's faith. Okay? So the law wasn't the means of righteousness. It had a specific purpose. Now, verses 17 to 18, it tells us that the law came 430 years after the promise. So after the promise was made to Abraham, 430 years comes the law. Now the promise is internal. It was God's plan before the foundation of the world for the promise, and the law doesn't change it, okay, as I just said. Now, in the Old Testament, in the period even of the law, what were they doing? They were looking to the coming Redeemer. You see, even throughout the Old Testament, it's spoken of the coming Redeemer. It's spoken of the coming Messiah. It's spoken of the Shiloh shall come and all this stuff in the Old Testament. And it's all pointing forward to the coming of Christ. They had to look ahead. We now look back because Jesus Christ already came. So God had put the plan in place to send the Redeemer to mankind, to come and save the people. And as we put faith in him, and we put faith in his finished work at the cross, then what happens? We are saved. So therefore, people of all ages are justified by faith in Christ, who is the promised seed. Why? Because the purpose of the law was what? To reveal to men that they were sinners. It was to reveal to men that they needed the Savior. That was its purpose. And so the law pointed people to Christ, the coming Redeemer, who would come. And so you can't have it both ways. So the law, what does the law teach us? The law teaches us that we are, what? Sinners. It doesn't teach us that righteousness comes by works. It doesn't do that. If it did, then we would have two systems. We would have justification coming by faith, and then we'd also have justification coming by works. But they're all opposed to each other because one puts its faith in man's ability to fulfill the, pro to fulfill the law. If we're justified by faith, then we're justified by our ability to keep the law. Sorry, let me back up. If we are justified by the law, then we are what? It's dependent upon our ability to keep it. And then we can boast. But with Jesus Christ, justification by faith is all dependent upon him. And we put our trust in him for our justification, for our righteousness. The two are opposed to each other. The two are opposite. Okay? But the law doesn't nullify the promise. It points people to faith in Christ. So the law actually fulfills God's purpose by, by helping people find their redemption in Christ. By helping people to know their need for the redemption that is in Christ. Their need in Christ. I want to quote from William MacDonald. He summarizes these three verses here. And he says, he says, Paul's argument in this section may be summarized as follows. In Genesis 12, 3, God promised to bless all families of the earth and Abram. This promise of salvation included Gentiles as well as Jews. In Genesis 22, 18, God promised, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He said seed, singular, and not seeds, plural. God was referring to one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was a direct descendant of Abraham. In other words, God promised to bless all nations, Gentiles as well as Jewish, through Christ. The promise was unconditional. It required neither good works nor legal obedience. It was a simple promise meant to be received in simple faith. Now the law given to Israel 430 years later could not add conditions to the promise nor alter it in any way. In human affairs, this would be unrighteous. 
In divine matters, it would be unthinkable. The conclusion, therefore, is that God's promise of blessing to the Gentiles is through Christ by faith and not law-keeping. You also have to remember is that the Gentiles, the Bible says, is that they were never under the law. It wasn't given to them. It was given to Israel. But now God is doing something new in Christ. He's bringing in this new covenant where Jew and Gentile both come together in Christ. And they're made one in Christ. We become part of the body of Christ. This is what Paul calls a mystery, something that wasn't previously revealed but is now revealed in this time, that Christ is building his church and he's bringing both Jew and Gentile together as one people through the blood of Christ and through faith in him, not by the works of the law. And so we come to this next section here in verses 19 through 29. And we answer the question, why was the law then given? And what we first see, he says, why then, in verse 19, why then? Or why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. So, in verse 19 we see that the law is given for what purpose? Because of transgressions, okay? But then he also talks about how there has to be a mediator. And in verse 20, now a mediator is not only for one party only, whereas God is only one. So what we first see is that the purpose of the law was to reveal to mankind that they were sinners. Paul would say in Romans 7, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And he says, may it never be. On the contrary, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So, in other words, Paul would have never known what sin was until the law came. Now remember, there was a whole period of time before the law. And so they, there were people who lived before the time of the law who never had this, this righteous standard of God that pointed out what sin was. Okay? They didn't know. There wasn't something that they were trying to live by. They didn't know what the righteous standard of God was. But then as soon as the law came in place, what happened? The law revealed that. Now man had a knowledge of what sin was. Because the law said, don't do this. The law said, don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. And now man knew what sin was. Now they knew what the righteous standard of God was. And so what the law's role was, was to reveal sin. And what the law did was it revealed that every man was a sinner. But it also, with it, brought a penalty. And the penalty was what? It was death, right? For the wages of sin is death. And we find out, we know from the Bible, that the law condemns man to death. Why? Because man is a sinner, and man breaks the law of God. And so those who were under the law, when the law was brought in, what happened? As they began to try and live by the law, what did they do? They found out that what? They couldn't uphold it. They found out that they couldn't keep it. Now, a part of that law that God brings in is the sacrificial system, where people would offer, sinners would offer what? They would offer sacrifices, animals. And so what they would do is they would bring an animal, and that animal would be its substitute. That animal would then pay the price for their sin. The sin of the person was imputed to that animal, and that animal was sacrificed on their behalf, and the blood became a covering for them. It would cover their sins. What was this doing? God put this system in place to teach them about what? The coming Redeemer. He put that system in place to teach them about Christ who was to come. The Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. You see, that sacrificial system couldn't take away sins. God was not satisfied with the blood of bulls and goats, but it acted as a covering for them so that his judgment wouldn't come upon them. (laughs) 
It acted as a covering of sin, but it wouldn't remove sin. You see, in Jesus Christ now, what happens? The blood of Jesus Christ removes sin. It washes us of our sins. We receive complete forgiveness. It breaks the power of sin in our lives, which the law couldn't do. The sacrificial system never broke that power, right? But Jesus Christ does. So this was brought in to teach the people. And it was to point them to the one who was coming. You remember when Abraham takes Isaac to the, to the mountain to sacrifice him. And as he's about to sacrifice, and the angel, the Lord tells him to stop. And then what does he end up telling you? He says, look it, the Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. Amen. That sacrifice was Jesus Christ. He was teaching Abraham right there. No, look at them pointing to the future. There's one who's coming in the future. He's going to die for the sins of the world. And by faith in him, everybody is going to be saved. They're going to be justified by faith in his finished work, by the shedding of his blood. His blood is going to wash you of your sins. He's going to cleanse you of your sin. And everybody's going to have a righteous standing before God by faith in him. They'll become the sons and daughters of God. And in the promise of Abraham, it extends to what? The whole world. Both Jew and Gentile. Amen. All are made righteous by faith in Christ. So there was one who was going to come in the future who was going to be the substitute for all sinners. This is what the sacrificial system was teaching. But the sacrificial system, as I said, it was insufficient it couldn't remove but only cover. So it pointed to the perfect sacrifice, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us about this. In Hebrews 10, verses 3 through 14, I know it's a lot to read, but it's worth it. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 through 14, it says, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. So see, what is the law doing? It's pointing to them. Look at, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. Year by year, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. There needs to be a sacrifice in your place. You have to offer sacrifices. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this... Will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all? Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. You see, God gave him a body. He says, I have come. I have taken on a body. Why? Because God was not pleased in the blood of bulls and goats. He was not satisfied in those things. So I took on a body. I came. I humbled myself to the point of death, to the death on the cross. To give myself as a sacrifice. To wash the sins of sinners away. But you know what? That blood was also a propitiation for our sins. And what that means is it was a satisfaction for our sins. Who was being satisfied in the offering of Christ? It was God the Father himself. Because our sins offended God. It was against him who we had sinned. So he was the one who had to be appeased. And so when he offers the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the shedding of his blood is pleasing to him. 
and it makes atonement for the sins of people. And we are forgiven forever. We are washed clean, and we all become part of the family of God now because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen to how tiring that was in Hebrews 10. Day after day, the priests were at work offering sins or <laughs> offering sacrifices for the sins of the people. How tiring would that be? This work never stops. Why? Because man is a sinner and he can't stop sinning. He can't stop breaking God's law until Christ comes. Then he makes a one-time sacrifice which pleases God forever. That's what God was doing in his son. And this is what the law was pointing out. The law was given because of transgressions. But even though the law, it didn't make anyone righteous, it was good and it served a purpose. What was it doing? It was leading people to Jesus. This is what it was doing. Romans 7.12 So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy. It's just and it's good. That is the purpose of the law. Because now, what were they finding out? The law was revealing their sinners. They knew that every day. The sacrifices, every time an animal was being sacrificed and given. Imagine that every day, seeing animals dying in your place, shedding their blood because you sinned. I wouldn't be able to bear that. I love animals. <laughs> that would be hard. But what does it do? It reveals how awful my sin is to God. But thank God for Jesus Christ who comes and sets us free. But we have to know the proper place of the law. The law is to point us to Christ. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 11. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person. Did you hear that? It's not made for a righteous person. Are you the righteousness of Christ? Yes, you are. You should be more confident than that. Are you the righteousness of Christ? Yes and amen. The law isn't for you. Jesus has made you righteous already. But the law has to be used lawfully. The law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy, the profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, murderers, the immoral man, liars, perjurers, kidnappers, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So, it's given for who? It's given for sinners, so that they can know they're sinners, and they can find salvation in Christ. So this was the law's purpose, to lead people to Christ until Christ came. Now that Jesus came, he fulfilled the law, he paid the price for the sins of the people. And now the message that we preach today is not that of law, but we preach what? That a person is justified by faith in Christ and his finished work. And so the law was in effect until the promised seed came. Then what? Complete. Done. It's not a means of righteousness today. It's not the way that you and I live today. If you try and live by the law today, you are going to fail even as a born-again believer. Because what? We're to live by what? Faith in Christ. And it's only by faith in Christ that can we live righteously. Because it's then that the Holy Spirit goes to work in our lives. He's the one that begins to produce that righteousness in us. But if we go to the law, the law is not of faith anymore. It's of works. It's of your ability. Now the Holy Spirit isn't working. You're depending upon yourself. And you're going to fail every time. This is why a lot of Christians are struggling today. This is why they're in bondage. When we're talking about sin, there's a lot of them struggling. How can I get out of this? How can I deal with this? You've got to understand, Jesus Christ already dealt with it. Now put your faith in him, put your trust in what Christ has done, and allow the Holy Spirit to go to work. Be led by the Spirit of God. 
Let him lead and guide you. Let him give you the ability, enable you to live in righteousness. Don't put your trust in yourself. Don't put yourself under a system. Well, if I just do this more and do this and do this and do that. No, put faith in Christ. Depend upon what he did for you. That's what we're to do today. And that's where many people are failing because they don't understand that. They think we have to do, 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 do. Now, we are saved to good works. And there are things that help us. But it's a walk in faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Trusting in him. Your faith has to be there. It has to be anchored in what Christ has done for you. So the law was in effect until the promised seed came. Who is Jesus? And so now through Jesus, all people would be blessed by faith. The law was in place for about 1,500 years. It came after the promise, but it only lasted until Christ came, till the promised seed came. And it served its purpose. It served its purpose. It points us, it points us to Christ. Now another thing here is he says in verse 19 and through 20 is that the law was inferior to the promise because it needed a mediator. The a mediator stands between two parties. A mediator is not needed when, it's only, when only one party is involved. A mediator has to come between two parties. When the law was put in place, it was a law, it was a, it was a, a covenant between God and man. God said, if you did this, you would be blessed. If you follow and obey this law, you will be blessed. You break it, you're cursed. Okay? So God put it in effect. Man had to uphold it. Okay? In order to be blessed. He had to uphold it by himself, by his own ability. But not the promise. The promise is not dependent upon you and I. It's not dependent upon anything that we did. For we are saved by grace through faith, not by works that anyone would boast. But what? It's the free gift of God that is given to us. See, the promise comes as a gift. God gives it to us. And all he requires is what? Faith. Abraham was justified by what? By faith. Putting faith in the promise of God. You and I are justified by putting faith in the promise of God. That's how we are justified. Not by anything that we do. Amen. So there's no mediator. You know, it tells us here that when the law was given, it came from God through angels to Moses to the people. Okay? So look at how many are involved there. There's mediators that are involved, but not the promise. The promise is given personally from God to Abraham. No mediator is involved. And so therefore, the law was inferior. One, also because man couldn't keep his side of the bargain. But in the promise, it's just based on God. It's based on his word. It's based on what Christ has done. So it's not dependent upon us at all. So the law was inferior to the promise because it needed a mediator. And God himself cannot fail. So the promise never fails. The promise is always in place. Men will always be justified by faith. It will never change. Nothing will ever change. Nothing will be added to it. Because God is faithful to his promises. And when you put faith in it, you can be assured that you're saved, that you are justified. You have a right standing before God because it's not dependent upon anything I do. It's based off faith. And faith isn't works. It's simply believing God. And so he asks again in verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promise of God? And he says, may it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based off the law. So he says the law doesn't, is not contrary to the promise. It doesn't affect the promise in any way. Because it's not competing with the promise. The promise came to justify. The law came 
so that we can have awareness of sin and we can come to faith in Christ and be justified. It doesn't oppose. It doesn't work against. It doesn't bring in two ways of salvation. No. And so again, may it never be, for if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. And what we, knew, we know from, what verse was that? Galatians 2.21. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So what do we learn there? Righteousness doesn't come through the law, does it? And so therefore, they're not contrary to one another, not working against one another, not opposed to one another. They're not two different systems. No, the law is pointing to Christ, and Christ justifies. Because if the law did make a person righteous, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come. Amen. But look at verses 22 to 23. It teaches us here that the law imprisons a person. But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. So the law imprisoned a person. And when he says there, the scriptures reveal, what's he speaking about? He's speaking about the law. The law imprisoned us, it put us in a jail cell. Now how does it do that? See, everyone is imprisoned by the law because everybody is guilty of breaking it and then they're under its sentence, which is death. So we're imprisoned. That's all the law does, is it imprisons us. Reveals we're sinners, it puts us under the penalty and we are condemned by the law. So we're all imprisoned by it. But how do we get released from it? We get released from it by faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us. You see, he alone can save a person from the penalty and the power of sin. He can give them power to live in righteousness by his spirit. The moment we put faith in Christ, the prison gates are open and we are set free by his blood. Because no longer are we condemned by the law. No longer is the penalty of the law against us because Christ already bore it for us. Christ already paid the penalty for us. And so what does he do? He completely sets us free. And I'm no longer a prisoner to the law. Amen. I have freedom in Christ. I'm set free. Amen. Now I live in that liberty which Christ has set me free. Amen. And then he goes on to tell us that the law was a guardian in verses 24 through 29. The law was a guardian until Christ. Now what does that mean? Listen to this. This comes from another commentary. It says, The guardian was usually a trusted slave who was in charge of a child's moral welfare. But he had one particular duty to which Paul was referring. Every day the guardian took the child to school and he delivered him to the teacher. And at the end of the day, he returned for the child and brought him safely back home. This is what the law was to do. The law was to lead man to Christ, the true teacher. The law does this by showing man that he's utterly unable to secure righteousness by himself. He must look to Christ, the real teacher, for righteousness and acceptance by God. That is for justification by faith. And so the Law, it acted as a guardian or a tutor, somebody who was entrusted in the care of this child to bring them to the teacher. The law was the guardian or the tutor to bring man to Christ. So just as, verse 25, but now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. Because the law served its purpose. See, there was no need for the guardian when the child was with the teacher. The same is true for the law. Now that Christ has come, there's no need for the law. A person who comes by faith in Christ is not under the law. They experience the liberty that is in Jesus. They're freed from the, from the prison and the guardian of the law. I hope this is sinking in. Because, you know, this has been really repetitive. 
And I think Paul does this for a reason. He wants to hammer this into our brains. Because there will be people, even today, who will try and put you under a system of law. And Paul's saying, no, 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 that ain't going to work. That's not how this whole thing works. You live by faith. You're justified by faith. The law points you to Christ. And so what happens as a result of justification by faith and not the law is that we become sons of God. Look at verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The law never made you a son. The law never made anybody a son. It's faith in Christ that makes you a son. You're adopted into the family of God. You receive the Spirit of God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Amen. We know we belong to Him because we have His Spirit. Amen. So I am a son because of faith in Christ. And then he says, for all of you who are baptized in Christ, you have clothed, clothed yourselves in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and your heirs according to the promise. All of that happens by faith. We are all sons. We now become his children. We enter into a relationship with him where we get to experience the benefits of what God our Father has done for us in his son. And the purpose of the law was to, to lead men to that point. But he says in verse 27, you were baptized, you who were baptized into Christ have, been, have clothed yourselves with Christ. What does he mean by that? You who have been baptized with Christ are now clothed in Christ. He's talking about our born-again experience. He's not talking about water baptism here. You might automatically think that. He's speaking about um, spirit baptism. You see, the moment that we are born again, the moment we put in faith, faith in Christ to be saved, we are immediately identified with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. It says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. You see, the moment that you are saved, the Spirit of God baptizes you into Jesus Christ. And you become a part of the body of Christ. So this is where you're identified in his death, burial, and resurrection. And so when people are baptized in water, what do we do? It symbolizes something. Right? He had dunk them, they're crucified and buried, and then they raise into newness of life as they come in out of the water. What is it doing? It's symbolic, it's showing, it's, it's a picture of what has happened spiritually when a person comes to Christ. Remember what Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives through me. Amen. There's your death, burial, and resurrection. I've died. I'm crucified. It's Christ who lives through me by the power of his Spirit. It's that resurrection life now. I'm born again of the Spirit. So we've been baptized into Christ. We are sons. We are all one. We are Abraham's seed. We're heirs according to the promise of God. Think about that. The law could never do that. But Christ does it for us. Christ makes this available to us. As we put faith in him, we're baptized in him, and we're, when we clothe ourselves with Christ, we are part of him. We're united to him. We are identified with him. We are now children of God and heirs according to the promise. Justified by faith and indwelt by his spirit. Real quickly, I just want to go to Ephesians and point something out here. 
Ephesians 2, in verse 13 through 22, it says, For it is God who works, is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Why does that not sound right? Because I'm, I'm in Philippians. I'm not in Ephesians. That's why. Chapter 2, verse 13 of Ephesians. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. You who formerly were far off, speaking of the Gentiles, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, one, and he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. See, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. What did it do? It brought enmity between Jew and Gentile. But then he says in verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile, in one body to God through the cross, and by having put to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off, far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Ephesians 3 1 to 8, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and if, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, by referring to this when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promises in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. You and I, or Gentiles, were excluded from the family of God. They were excluded from the covenants. They were excluded from the pro promises. There was enmity between the Jew and Gentile. The Jew looked at the Gentiles as dogs. But now in Christ, everything changes. God, the law fulfills its purpose. He does away with it. And now both Jew and Gentile are justified by faith in Christ. The enmity, is, the dividing wall is removed. We become one in Christ together. And now we all become heirs. And we all receive the promises of God in Christ Jesus. You see, the Galatian church was in danger of walking away from all of this. Because the Judaizers were trying to pull them away back into the law for righteousness, the law for salvation, the law for sanctification. And they would, they would have forfeited the grace of God. They wouldn't have become a part of this great work which Christ had done. They wouldn't have become, you know, becoming sons is only through faith. Inheriting the promises, becoming heirs of God is only through faith in Christ. This is how we come into a relationship with God, through the blood of Jesus and by faith in him alone. The law can never accomplish that. And we don't live by law today. We live by faith in Christ. Amen?